gives me great pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Chris Turner. Chris Turner is one of Canada's leading writers and speakers on sustainability and the global green economy. He draws on recent breakthroughs in state-of-the-art renewable energy and urban design to paint a vivid portrait of a new sustainable world order and will, that will allow individuals and businesses alike not only to survive but to thrive in the 21st century economy. A two-time National Business Book Award finalist, his most recent book, How to Breathe Underwater, Field Reports from an Age of Radical Change, which is a collection of his award-winning short stories, um, his, and his book of 2013, The War on Science, he was a co-winner of the Writers' Union of Canada Freedom to Read Award, and also, also author of The Leap of How to Survive and Thrive in Sustainable Economies, which the Globe and Mail called one of the most arresting arguments for building a green economy yet in print. So I, it is with great pleasure, uh, Chris, who was named one of Alberta's next 10 most influential Albertans, by the Alberta Venture Magazine. Um, I'd like to call you forward. Chris lives in Calgary with his wife and two, two children, and I think he'll give you a lot of food for thought and hope. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thanks, first of all, uh, to the committee and the, and the organization for giving me a chance uh, to talk to you all here off the top. Uh, thanks everyone for that wonderful opening uh, ceremony. Uh, I always love to hear the pipes. I, my family is originally from Nova Scotia, so there's a very deep nostalgic uh, feel that that gives to me to, to, to be able to, to share a room with some, some bagpipes off the top there. Uh, thanks as well to the city of Campbell River and to Mary Adams for hosting this event. And especially thanks to the uh, Municipal Finance Authority of BC for sponsoring uh, my keynote this afternoon. I uh, hope to make it worth your while. I know you've got a lot of you know uh, uh, very sort of nitty gritty, fine detailed kind of stuff to work out about uh, your communities. What I'm hoping to do this afternoon is talk about uh, what I consider to be the sort of defining trend, sort of mega trend of the, of the 21st century, uh, which is the global energy transition now underway. And if you haven't already felt it shake the ground under your feet, it, I, I assure you it will, and hopefully I'll make that clear. Uh, basically what we are uh, now embarked upon in the 21st century is a fundamental reinvention of the industrial basis of modern society, moving from uh, predominantly fossil fueled energy to predominantly renewable energy. And sometimes, particularly in British Columbia, that can seem like something that's not that big a deal, in particular since there is so much abundant hydroelectricity in this province that the grid here is already green uh, for all intents and purposes, and, and a certain amount of the, the job can already seem done. Uh, what I hope to explain to you uh, a bit this afternoon is how this goes much beyond just how we produce energy to how we use it, the kind of communities that we uh, uh, build around a, a new sort of energy basis for society and the rest of it. Uh, this is something that British Columbia has already shown a lot of leadership in, uh, and, and I, I'll highlight that as we go along and then hopefully bring it down to the level of what a you know, community on Vancouver Island or on the coast of uh, British Columbia uh, can do to begin sort of embracing the, the, this shift. Um, and hopefully make the case that, that, that it's an extraordinary opportunity for your communities as well uh, to take part in. Uh, in its simplest form, as I said, what we're talking about is a transition from one energy basis to another, from fossil fuels, uh, which currently provide more than 85% of the world's primary energy to renewable energy, uh, not just uh, wind and solar, but, but all uh, uh, carbon dioxide free uh, energy, which includes obviously hydroelectricity, making that transition ideally in about a half century or so in order to stay off catastrophic climate change. Uh, we are already beginning to experience some pretty severe impacts of climate change around the world. Those impacts are deepening. All of the feedback mechanisms that 10 or 15 years ago climate scientists were saying uh, were you know, at the outside realm of possibility for this first 15 or 20 years uh, are already happening. The system is actually, uh, uh, the feedback mechanism is actually much more intense than a lot of the, the climate scientists and climate models would have predicted 15, 20 years ago. Uh, by way of just one example, just to ground us in why this energy transition is happening, uh, about 
almost 10 years ago now, I was in Australia doing some reporting on impacts on the uh, Great Barrier Reef, potential long-term impact of climate change on the Great Barrier Reef, both from the warming of the water and from the acidification of, of, of the world's oceans, which absorb a lot of our carbon dioxide. Uh, over a quarter of it. And at the time, when you talk to, to scientists, they said, you know, 20, 30 years out, we might start to see catastrophic bleaching events uh, that the reef might not be able to fully recover from, uh, maybe 20 or 30 years out. The first of those events occurred this year. Uh, we are already experiencing the scale of catastrophic climate change that we had hoped was, was more than a generation or, or, or so off and that we would have more time uh, to try and mitigate. So absolutely remains the essential project of the 21st century to reduce our carbon footprint globally uh, by well over 80% of its current size. And that's a pretty extraordinary job. And in the first flush of it, the first sort of 15, 20 years of grappling with this, uh, what I kind of sometimes refer to as sustainability 1.0, a lot of what we did was try to be less bad. Uh, it's kind of the, you know, the three R's approach to environmental stewardship, do less bad stuff. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, but make it a little bit less dirty, uh, a little less uh, carbon intensive, a little more efficient, that sort of thing. And there were some extraordinary successes, uh, to be sure, in that first phase. Uh, some of them right here in Canada, things like uh, Ontario's coal phase, out. Still the single biggest step that any major jurisdiction has taken in North America toward reducing its carbon footprint. Uh, here in British Columbia, one of the first carbon taxes ever put in place uh, uh, at a provincial or federal level uh, in North America and has become a model around the world for how to, how to do uh, carbon pricing. Uh, so definitely some really amazing stuff and more than that on the plus side, uh, an extraordinary shift in the uh, quality and price of the technology that we need to build that low carbon economy. Uh, I won't go too far into the, the, the numbers or the details, but just to give you kind of an overview if you haven't been paying attention, uh, since 2008, the cost of a solar panel has plunged by more than 80%. The cost of a wind turbine has plunged by more than 50%. Uh, Electric, sale, electric vehicle sales are booming. The scale of build out of all of this stuff uh, is already at a pace that would not have been predicted 10 years ago. Uh, just to give an example, in the um, past year, uh, in solar power alone, the world added, uh, I'm trying to remember, something like 77 gigawatts of power. Uh, that is as much solar as existed everywhere on Earth five years ago. So we're you know, basically seeing this exponential growth uh, in the scale of deployment of, of these, these green technologies. Uh, often in these discussions, uh, when we get into the big global picture, you'll hear people start to say, well, what about, you know, what about the developing world? What about China and India with their fast-growing economies, building coal plants as fast as they can? And it's a fair point, but if you look uh, past the, the, the kind of uh, smoke of it all, uh, what's actually happening on the ground in places like China and, and India is they are moving very, very quickly toward leadership roles in the transition I'm going to be describing. China, for example, is planning to invest more than $300 billion in wind and solar energy uh, in the next five years. That's just in deployment in China, 300 billion. Uh, and China also has become the world's maker of, of uh, clean technology from electric vehicles to, to solar panels to wind turbines. Uh, India, uh, to give it another data point, planning to get more than 50% of all of its electricity from non-fossil fuel sources within 10 years. Uh, one very high profile thing India has just announced is that they will be putting solar panels on all 7,000 of the country's railway stations. So when you hear talk of this, this energy transition, particularly in the last you know, five, 10 years, there's a lot of talk of, well, maybe we're really not going to go that far with this stuff. Maybe it's all just sort of a fad. Maybe everything good that we could possibly do about it will be undone by coal plants in China. Uh, that's simply not the case now. What we're seeing actually is a pretty significant global commitment uh, to meeting uh, the challenge of climate change. And the, the great signpost of that, uh, as murky as those international UN talks on climate are, was the 2015 uh, uh, Paris climate talks, which a lot of people did not hold out a lot of hope for. And out of that emerged a global commitment uh, to, to emissions reduction by mid-century in order to keep global warming not just to, to below two degrees Celsius, which was the long-standing kind of benchmark for catastrophic climate change, but perhaps even 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're still a long way off of that. Uh, there's not a single country on Earth that's actually on track to meet a two degrees Celsius climate target. Uh, but what this does mean is that there is now near universal agreement 
And even if there is a particular resident of the White House in Washington right now uh, who is one of the lone standouts not part of that universal agreement, the momentum of the thing itself continues uh, unabated, particularly for, by, by way of example in the United States. In clean energy circles, uh, the attitude is very much business as usual. Uh, you look at some of the leading jurisdictions in the U.S. for this, uh, they are states like Texas and Iowa and Nebraska. Uh, not known for their, their sort of uh, uh, left-leaning politics, but are well known for having fantastic renewable energy resources and developing, develop them, developing them sorry, as fast as possible. Uh, here in Canada, we have seen since the Paris Agreement by far uh, the single deepest and, and, and most rapid uh, commitment to real climate action that this country has ever undertaken. Uh, for a long time during that first less bad period of, of sustainability, uh, we here in Canada played pretty good lip, ser lip service to doing something about climate change. We signed on to the agreements, we made the commitments, but we did almost nothing to actually meet any of them. Uh, we are now actually putting in place the kind of legislation that will make things happen. Things like national carbon pricing, a national coal phase-out, which doesn't mean a lot to you here in, in British Columbia, but is a pretty big deal in places like Alberta, uh, where coal is still a very big part of our grid, and so on and so forth. What we're seeing now is a coordinated effort, uh, not just am among government, but really among almost every sector of society. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to do some work with an organization called Smart Prosperity, uh, based out of the University of Ottawa, which has brought together dozens and dozens of industry leaders, civil service leaders, heads of unions, uh, heads of First Nations, uh, you know, pe former presidents of oil companies, a very, very wide swath of the kind of thought leadership of the country, uh, all, of, all of whom are committing not just to you know, meeting a particular climate change target, but to committing the Canadian economy and Canadian society uh, to real action on climate change and building a better um, and, and, and more efficient economy out of this transition. And I think that's really uh, one of the pieces that often gets lost in this conversation. We are not talking about uh, bitter medicine that we must swallow for all of our, our climate sins. There's actually an extraordinary opportunity emerging, and that's why you can get people like you know, the former president of Shell Canada and uh, you know, someone from the, the opposite end of the spectrum in green, in green technology signing on to a, 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 a sort of policy plan like the Smart Prosperity Plan uh, is because everyone now sees the opportunity. I've been at this for about 15 years, researching, writing about it, talking about it, and I can tell you it used to be a very, very lonely uh, sort of place to stand in a country that was deeply committed to a conventional resource economy and in a world that very much felt like it might never get moving all in the same direction. I think that's shifting enormously now. It can be one of those things that's hard to notice amid, amid all the noise uh, in the news and, and beyond on this subject, but there really is extraordinary momentum now uh, toward doing something. Uh, as I said, though, the, the noise of it often uh, uh, leaves us feeling like this is a polar, uh, po heavily polarized debate where you must pick a side. Uh, to put it very, very in very simple terms that, that I hear a lot of uh, in Alberta where I live, where there's a lot of oil and gas uh, activity, you know, are we going to keep it in the ground uh, or are we going to drill baby drill? Which, which of these two polar opposite futures are we going to pursue? Uh, and I think that part of that comes from the scale of the transition already and the amount of excitement and apprehension that a, a shift of this magnitude causes. When you're talking about changing the global energy basis of industrial society, you're t talking about changing everything. And that can be either very exciting or extraordinarily terrifying if you're very, very dug in on the, on, on the economy as it exists. Uh, I'll get to the, the sort of conventional energy side uh, in a minute, but one of the things you will hear from the sort of keep it in the ground crowd, and one of the things that I think has, has infected the debate around things like pipeline projects and uh, the expansion of the oil sands and that sort of thing here in Canada, uh, is the idea that uh, you know, we, we are, are dragging our feet uh, you know, because we have these conventional energy resources, when really it would really just take a little bit of coordinated effort to completely eliminate fossil fuels you know, in, in, in a decade or, or, or maybe a little longer. And this is something that I've, I've written about and, and researched heavily and gone to the leading jurisdictions. And I think uh, we, we've been so successful in generating excitement and momentum that now we need to, to, to kind of correct the record a little bit. It's absolutely possible today with current technology to power an entire industrial society with nothing but renewable energy. Doing that, however, is an extraordinarily large, expensive, and cumbersome shift that will not occur in five years or 10. It's a generational project. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, some, some of the leading jurisdictions, they are finding that the first 
you know, uh, half of the grid going from fossil fuels to renewables, that's, that, you can get that done pretty quickly. Uh, beginning to make a few inroads in terms of moving transportation away from uh, fossil fuel dependency, you can get some pretty big wins early on. But when you start looking at 100%, uh, it's still quite a good ways off. Uh, and what's more, one of the things we now know, and I'm going to get into some of the fine points of, of what the electricity grid and, 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 and what it looks like at household scale in a minute, but one of the things we have to keep in mind is that as we are worldwide uh, reducing the amount of fossil fuels on all these electricity grids, uh, we are moving more and more of how we make and use energy into the electricity field. So at the same time we're trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuels in the world's grids, we are going to be massively increasing the amount of electricity we need to generate. If you do things like shift from uh, conventional automobiles to electric vehicles, Vehicles, you've now got a whole lot more demand on those grids. Uh, so this is definitely a generational project. That is not to, to uh, put a wet blanket on anyone's grand plans. It's still very exciting stuff. But I do think that, that sometimes in the rhetoric, we, we, we get lost in, in either in thinking, no, this is not possible, or we could be doing it tomorrow if not for, for, uh, for all of this foot dragging. It's a generational project. We need extraordinary consensus and buy-in from every sector of society to make that transition. And we don't get very far if all we do is fight about one pipeline after another. Uh, that said, the debate about the pipelines, to, just to touch upon that, because that seems to be where in a lot of Canada our climate change conversation has focused, uh, that is a legitimate one. We are uh, not just in Alberta, but as a nation, very dug in on conventional energy resources. We produce a lot of them. We have a lot of them. And we need to be making very smart decisions about which of them uh, we should be investing in and how much and how far. That said, even the two degrees Celsius or beyond world agreed upon in Paris is still a world with quite a lot of fossil fuel in it for quite a long time. And so what I'd like to do to just kind of get everyone on the same page off the top here is just give you three numbers that to my mind, if you're looking at things like the expansion of the oil sands in Alberta and the pipelines that want to bring it to places like, uh, uh, you know, not quite the waters right out our door here, but not far from them. Uh, what, the, what the numbers that define that as a, as a decision uh, should be. The first one I've already mentioned is two degrees Celsius. This is really considered not even ambitious enough now in terms of putting off catastrophic climate change. So when we're talking about, you know, where should we be investing our, our uh, political capital, our, our, our investment capital, the rest of it in terms of energy resources, we need to be asking, how does that resource fit with a two degree Celsius world? And I think the conclusion we've already come to, if you look at some of the leading studies that have done the big number crunching on what are called carbon budgets, uh, which is basically to get to two degrees Celsius by 2050, how much of the world's Carbon di how much more carbon dioxide can we add to the Earth's atmosphere, and what does that mean for the fossil fuel economies? You look at the numbers coming out of that, and it begins to make a few things really clear. The first is that the days of coal are numbered. Uh, there's really no place in the uh, uh, global economy of, of a half century out for coal as a thing we burn to make electricity. Fortunately, phasing out coal is one of the easiest things to do, too, at a, at a, at a big uh, kind of grid level scale. Not super easy, but I mean, Ontario did it in less than 15 years, so it's not enormously complicated either. And again, this is one of those things, you know, with, with all due respect to the current occupant of the White House, uh, which is not a lot. Um, the, uh, uh, no matter how strongly uh, you might wish to turn back the clock, there is no smart investment to be made anymore in coal. Uh, so even if, you know, uh, the president likes to, to pose in a hard hat and say he's bringing those jobs back, the capital won't be there for them. People won't invest money in, an, in, 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 a, in a proposition that risky and that, and that poor, in part because coal isn't being phased out uh, entirely because of government legislation, but because it no longer makes much market sense. Uh, a lot of the investment that used to go to coal, even in the United States, is now going to natural gas, which is both cleaner and way cheaper as a, as a way to produce electricity. If you look at, uh, there was a study, for example, in the journal Nature a couple of years ago, uh, it still saw quite a lot of natural gas on the world's grids for a couple of decades, and then beginning to fall off uh, as, as renewable energy technologies ramped up. So very little coal, uh, not a lot of, uh, not, not, not a lot of you know, uh, immediate decline in, in natural gas, but long-term natural gas begins to play a less important role. And oil, as it turns out, still plays a pretty big role. Uh, there was a study, this, this study in Nature a couple of years ago, uh, made a lot of headlines in my home province of, uh, of Alberta for the second number I'm going to give you, 85%. 
uh, this was the headline making number. Uh, this was one of these carbon budget crunching things, looked at you know, the world's carbon budgets and said you know, the most uh, sort of fossil fuel or carbon intensive and most expensive fossil fuels are the ones to go first. That includes things like uh, the oil sands in northern Alberta, 85% of which, that was the number uh, in the conclusion of the study, 85% of which uh, current proven resources would have to stay in the ground to hit a two degree Celsius target. And what that sounded like at headline scale was they're saying that you know, the vast majority of oil sands investments are unviable in the, in the medium to long term. If you dug a little deeper in that study though, uh, there was actually a lot more going on kind of under the hood. Um, the third number from the same study uh, that the only person I know of made any mention of it all in, in the media around this was a guy by, by the name of Andrew Leach uh, at the University of Alberta who actually wrote or, or helped write Alberta's uh, climate plan. Uh, and that was this number, 75 million. Uh, 75 million under a two degrees Celsius scenario, that's the number of barrels per day by mid-century we will still be needing worldwide. Uh, when you looked at these two degrees Celsius scenarios and you hear about, you know, we're moving toward, you know, 80% uh, uh, or greater uh, 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 shrinking our, uh, of our carbon footprint, we're moving toward, you know, net zero, some economies committed to net zero carbon footprints, we're moving to, you know, eliminating coal entirely and people think oil follows suit. And there's that, a lot of the rhetoric around pipelines, for example, in this country suggesting, you know, we're not going to need oil that much longer. As it turns out, even under a two degrees Celsius scenario, which is very stringent, would require an enormous amount of coordinated effort to get to, we're still burning 75 million barrels per day of oil in, by mid-century. And given that a lot of our current resources would be depleted and exhausted by then, that means there's still going to be a lot of market pressure to unlock and exploit currently known resources, including ones like the ones in, in northern Alberta and northern BC. That doesn't mean we necessarily do that. What it means is this is the parameter of the debate, not yes or no, but does our current production, our future production, the kind of investments we're making, both privately and publicly, uh, support a two degree Celsius scenario and do the barrels of oil that we want to bring to market down pipelines, for example, fit in that 75 million that we know are, are probably still going to be around or some number like that by mid-century. Um, so I just mentioned that off the top. Those are the parameters. There is no credible study I've seen that draws a really, really clear way that we will be at you know, zero or even less than 10 million barrels of oil a day, for example, by mid-century. It still remains the world's most essential transportation fuel source under almost every study I've ever seen. Uh, there are a few 100% as possible type studies that, that imagine a radical shift to electric vehicles, but even they have to kind of really fudge around the edges to suggest that somehow uh, uh, by mid-century all the world's transport is electrified. Again, not to throw a, 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 a wet blanket on anyone's plans, I'm actually going to spend the rest of the afternoon, uh, for as long as I'm with you, talking about how exciting that transition remains, even in the face of the fact that we are still very much dependent on fossil fuels. Um, and if you look at the sort of uh, jurisdictions which are at the front rank, a lot of which are in Northern Europe, you begin to see very, very exciting stuff happening indeed. This is what the countryside looks like more and more in Germany, which is probably the single most important uh, uh, jurisdiction for the global energy transition to date. Germany was the uh, first major industrial country, large industrial country, to commit uh, kind of across the board to this transition. Uh, they began with their electricity grid, which they've taken from less than 5% renewables to more than 30% in the past decade or so, uh, happening at much quicker pace than was initially in, uh, anticipated, way faster pace than the current uh, 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 Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, thought was possible when she was in opposition. Uh, she remains a champion of Germany's green energy uh, industry and its energy transition, in part because it now employs hundreds of thousands of Germans, as well hundreds of thousands of Germans now have solar panels on their roofs or are part of a community scale investment in a wind turbine or a district heating system or some other way uh, that they are directly invested in the transition that's happening in their country. Uh, Germany along the way uh, you know, basically rationalized and made a modern industry of solar panel manufacture. Uh, did the same for a lot of the sort of energy efficiency technologies that are now used worldwide. Uh, in, reinvented how we how we build buildings from the ground up, thinking.
thinking about it from a, an efficiency and a, a, and a low carbon point of view. If you've ever heard of a passive house design, that's a German invention. Basically anything you're looking at, whether it's high efficiency windows or modern solar panels, somewhere down the line there was a made in Germany line, or uh, made in Germany label on that transition, even though a lot of it has now shifted to places like China in terms of the heavy manufacture. So we definitely did see in that first less bad phase some extraordinarily exciting and fast moving uh, change. Uh, even in Germany though, just to come back to the 75 million barrels of oil, uh, there is still an extraordinary dependence on oil for transport. Germans still drive cars, most of those cars uh, remain uh, fossil fueled. Um, now here in BC, you might look at what Germany's doing and think, well we're already well past them. Certainly that's how you know, German energy experts look at parts of Canada. They say you've already got, you know, uh, more than half the country uh, gets its power from, from hydroelectricity. Somewhere like BC, it's something like 90 or 95 percent of your power uh, electricity comes from uh, hydropower. So you really don't have the carbon problem that a lot of the world does from a grid point of view. Uh, but what I'd like to do is, is, is lay out for you uh, this next shift that I think is happening. The past 15 years were about uh, uh, doing less bad. The next 15, the next 20 are going to be about doing much better. And uh, to show you what I mean by that, we'll look at, at sort of a leading project. But in general, what I mean is uh, in the process of figuring out how to do less bad, and you know, basically to this point, what we've managed to do is flatten global uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So they're no longer growing as they had for, for decades and decades. Uh, but in the process of that, we're beginning to discover that these new tools work together in ways uh, that is way more exciting than the initial phase uh, might have indicated. We're no longer just talking about, hey, let's do a little bit less bad to help the planet. We're now talking about these things are much better and create a better value proposition for human society. Uh, and so let me take you through an example of that in one of the leading jurisdictions for the, this energy transition, Denmark. Uh, Denmark was a, a leader from very early on in the energy transition. If you look at why Denmark became a leader, it was because the OPEC oil crisis of the 1970s was so crippling there. They were heavily dependent on, on imported oil for all of their energy needs. Became, uh, in the process of dealing with that, a world leading jurisdiction for wind turbine manufacture and wind energy deployment. And now Denmark gets more than 30% of its uh, electricity capacity on its grid from wind. Uh, there are, in fact, certain windy days in Denmark, sometimes for days at a time, where 100% or more of the electricity on their grid is coming from wind energy. Uh, now, the Danes have been uh, planning for 50%, maybe even 80% wind within a couple of decades. And in the process of that planning, they had to think about what does that look like in terms of grid management, in terms of the kind of, uh, of, of technology we, we, we're using in our houses, in terms of how we drive around and the rest of it, what happens at 50% or 80% of your grid being from uh, wind turbines? And the biggest thing about this, the, the trickiest part of it, is that of course you can't predict when the wind's going to, to blow. Uh, hydroelectric dam, you can decide when to make power and when not to. Uh, with wind power, it just comes when it comes, same with solar, uh, and doesn't when it doesn't. And so that variability, that intermittency, is a pretty major problem once you get to more than half your grid coming from intermittent renewables. Uh, the Danes have been working on this for more than a decade now, and they think they've maybe cracked uh, at least uh, 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 the beginnings of the answer, and so that's what I'd like to lay out for you. Uh, when they got investigating this, it was the federal government, the Danish Energy Agency, and the Danish Technical University, and then they started bringing in companies like IBM and Siemens to start thinking about equipment. This occurred over about 10 years. Uh, the big problem they ran into was storage. If wind is going to be intermittent, you're going to have to store it when it comes for when you, uh, and, and then wait till you need it. And they didn't see any storage options, standalone storage options, uh, that were going to be cost effective enough. Their, their target date for the rollout of this was about 2025 nationally, and they didn't see storage batteries and things like that being cheap enough in 2025. However, as they got thinking about it, they thought, well, one of our other things by 2025, one of our other goals is that we will have hundreds of thousands of electric cars on the road. So if you've got hundreds of thousands of electric cars on the road, and cars spend most of their working life sitting in a 
parked somewhere, could that not be a vast distributed storage system for wind energy? And so that's exactly the model they are now testing on an island called Bornholm and have been testing since 2014, up and running, uh, with 1,900 homes and businesses connected to it. This is sort of the schematic of it. Uh, basically, the idea being you've got intermittent wind power. Uh, in particular, wind tends to blow strongest at night, so you're storing. Uh, you've got all these cars parked in all these garages, storing wind energy overnight, uh, buying it on the cheap, in a sense, uh, to recharge their cars, and then uh, using a smart grid to make very smart decisions about uh, when, to, when to demand energy uh, at, at everything from the kind of uh, business industrial level all the way down to the level of appliances in a home, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then those cars, when they get to whatever place they're going to be parked for most of the day, can be reconnected to the grid, and then that energy can be drawn on during the course of the day as needed. Uh, as I said, this is not a, uh, uh, a model or a computer simulation. They actually have built this on the island of Bornholm. This is what it looks like. It's a pretty little agrarian island. Uh, it's close enough to Copenhagen that it's sort of cottage country uh, for, for Copenhageners, but it's also sort of a working uh, agrarian community. Already gets more than 50% of its power from wind, so that was part of the reason why it made a good model uh, for this test, and also was very keen to be part of it. Uh, Bornholm sees itself potentially as, as a test bed for the world's next generation uh, energy projects once the Danish uh, uh, model has, has sort of proven itself. Um, this is a little look at some of the stuff they're playing around with, just so you get a sense of what is meant by this kind of new grid. Um, they did deploy a bunch of electric vehicles, uh, not enough for the whole system, but just a few to make sure that they worked all right, uh, owned by the, the energy company that's doing the test. Uh, the, the picture on the bottom is the sort of in-home smart grid equipment uh, that you would, you would have at, at, at a sort of household scale. Uh, the best example of this, if you're not familiar with it, often when we talk about smart grids in North America, all we talk about is net metering and, and, and smart meters that might be spying on you and that sort of thing. Um, the idea behind this would be the example that I was given is think of it, your, your household refrigerator. It's one of the biggest things in terms of energy demand in your house. And it is uh, very, very blunt about when it wants energy. It just hits a temperature threshold and kicks on and says, give me power now. You actually, as, a, a, as the user of the refrigerator, don't care when that happens. All you care about is it keeps the stuff inside cold within an acceptable range. Uh, so what if, instead of just kicking on as soon as it needs power, it was plugged through a, a smart plug and could check the price of power, check the current demand, check the demand trend, and make a smart decision about whether or not to kick on now or wait a half an hour or wait an hour. And if you have thousands of appliances making these decisions and thousands of households and thousands of businesses, all of a sudden the intermittency problem and, 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 and the, 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 the sort of uh, load problems that, that energy guys obsess over actually get a lot easier to solve because you just have a lot more options all of a sudden on your grid. And so that's what they're finding already actually in Bornholm is some of the stuff that they anticipated would be more expensive to deliver uh, sort of service-wise is actually getting cheaper as these uh, uh, sort of smart appliances are able to make good decisions about what they're doing. Um, if you ever want to go uh, and check it out, it's, as I said, it's not far from Copenhagen. They've set up this Villa Smart, which you see on the left, uh, with all of the technology, everything from solar panels on the roof to, to various gadgets inside. Uh, there's a big Lego scale model of the whole thing, because it's Denmark, so of course there's a Lego scale model of the whole thing. Uh, the most interesting thing, actually, is the, the, the picture on the right, which this was one of their solutions for the fact that there wasn't enough cars, electric cars, yet on the island for the, for the scale model. Uh, in in Denmark, this was kind of a, uh, an add-on, but in, it, and the reason for that is because most Danish homes are actually on district heating systems. Very few Danish homes have their own furnace or other uh, uh, heating source. They're, they're on these sort of village or town scale district uh, sources. But one of the things they, they came up with to store uh, uh, the wind energy until it was needed was to store it basically as heated water. And th so that's basically a, uh, a heated water storage uh, unit that's being used to heat that Villa Smart home. This is kind of unnecessary in Denmark, but might be hugely useful uh, one day here in Canada where we are much more reliant on our own individual heat sources. Um, and of course, the, the, the uh, reason for that is they didn't have enough cars yet. And I'm going to address that now. But first, uh, to come back to this idea of a value proposition, you think of, you know, uh, look at the way, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, the way we've kind of organized our towns and cities across North America and in much of the world more and more, uh, very much centered around the value proposition 
almost of a kind of suburban existence. Even if we don't live in suburban communities, we live in communities where the ideal, in any case, is an uh, you know, ideally detached home or an individual residence with a garage, maybe even a two-car garage to store our own vehicles in, and where we meet our daily needs through the ease and convenience of driving everywhere we need to go using very, very cheap fuel. And that was sort of the 20th century value proposition of the good life. If you wanted, you know, if you had the opportunity, you were going to pursue the two-car garage and the, and the detached home and, the, and, and the, the cars that drive you everywhere you go. Uh, the value proposition emerging from this energy transition looks a bit different. It begins with the possibility that instead of just uh, uh, being an energy consumer, you might want to be an energy producer. And this is the kind of thing that even in somewhere like British Columbia where electricity is extraordinarily cheap and it's very hard to make a business case right now for a lot of renewables, that might begin to shift. Uh, because of the value proposition emerging. Now, this is an extreme example. These are houses, townhouses actually, in southern Germany that make more power than they, conser uh, than they consume over the course of a year. These are net energy producing uh, residences. And it's not just because the solar resource is so great in Germany. It's actually not that good in Germany. Uh, the solar resource in most of Canada is better than in most of Germany. It's mainly that these townhomes were designed from the ground up to be net energy producing. It's a funny thing about design and engineering. If you don't even consider an option, you'll never stumble on it. Uh, so we never stumbled on net energy producing houses because that wasn't part of our design equation. Once you put it in, uh, designers and architects can solve that real quick. So you, this is the first piece of the value proposition is you might make some of your own energy. Uh, and even if you don't, you might be buying it on the cheap overnight. You will uh, be able to make smart decisions for the first time ever about how you use energy at a household scale, at a business scale. Uh, we already know if all you do is move an electricity meter inside a person's house where they can see it, let alone actually give it some sort of interface that tells you what's happening, uh, people will start using less power because they can see their consumption for the first time ever. Uh, so imagine something you know, at, the, at the scale we already see of a, an app on your phone that can give you very, very good, clean information about what you're doing wrong and how you could correct it, being able to do so remotely, making smart decisions, predicting uh, you know, what's happening on the grid. Uh, it, currently in Denmark, they're doing five-minute increments of pricing, but there's absolutely no reason uh, logistically why that couldn't eventually be you know, seconds even uh, of decision making. And then the third piece of it, if you still choose to own a car, uh, would be that you have a car that is entirely electrically powered and allows you to become an energy broker. Uh, you buy energy on the cheap overnight from the wind or from whatever source, and uh, you know how much of it you are going to need over the course of the day. You drive to work, you plug it back in, and you broker it back to the grid at a higher price as demand increases over the course of the day. I would argue that value proposition, even if you take climate change out of it, would make a pretty good case for itself. 10 or 15 years out. If that's becoming more and more the uh, uh, emerging standard of what a house can be, of what you know, energy use and, and, and consumption can be, I think it probably beats a lot of the conventional stuff we rely on now all by itself before you even get into the idea that carbon may have a higher price on it, that you are committed to uh, the transition for other reasons than, than simply you know, liking it, et cetera. And the reason I'm pretty confident this is going to happen inside of 15, maybe 20 years is actually because of the car. Uh, some of you may recognize that car. That is the Tesla Model S. Uh, Tesla Model S, pretty remarkable. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, very little of which have to do with it being electric. Uh, that was really the great design revolution of the Tesla Model S, was Elon Musk did not say, let's go build a zero emissions car. He said, let's go build the best car on the road, and it will happen to be zero emissions. It is, in fact, the best car on the road. It's the fastest uh, car on the road, by far the safest car on the road. Remember Volvo built their entire brand around being the safest car on the road? Tesla is many, many orders of magnitude safer as a car to drive than your average Volvo. The reason for this is because you're not trying to protect an internal combustion engine in a crash, so you have a much larger crumple zone, and you can make the, the, the body of the thing where you're actually sitting much more rigid and much more uh, uh, safe to be trapped inside of in the event of an accident. So when they did the rollover test on the Tesla Model S, the machine that attempts to crush the, the, the car broke without being able to actually crush the Tesla. Uh, they don't even make a big deal about that when, in, their, in their marketing or anything, but it is the safest car on the road. Smartest car on the road by far, fixes itself with software patches most of the time. You don't take it to a mechanic, the mechanic basically gets downloaded into the car uh, for most of the things that go wrong with it. It's got an incredibly brilliant onboard computer and on and on. Uh, this is not to say that the future of the world is in uh, driving Teslas around, 
uh, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the limits of cars in, in, in terms of our urban environment. Uh, what it is to say is this is the speed of transition we're now seeing into that much better new phase of the sustainability economy where Tesla is a, is a car that people buy on its own merits, not because it happens to solve a green problem. And more than that, if you were standing, as I was, at a racetrack in Montreal, it was about 15 years ago now, uh, and you were, all of the world's leading automotive manufacturers had come to this electric vehicle symposium to show the world all their best next generation cars, the, the hydrogen powered car that Ford was playing around with, and the thing that became the Prius, and the thing that became the Nissan Leaf, and on and on. And there was not a single person at that electric vehicle symposium who said, you know, stood up and said, hey, you know what's actually going to happen is some crazy dot-com billionaire is going to start a car company from scratch, beat us all to the punch, and then give away the patents. Uh, no one saw that coming, and the rate of transition there is pretty extraordinary. Tesla is a great example of the rate of transition. As I said, they've moved on from, from car manufacture. They're now looking at how do you make household scale standalone wall batteries work? How do you make uh, tile for, for a house that's cheaper and better than regular tile and happens to be solar powered? How do you make that work? These are the kind of problems Tesla's moved on to. And it's interesting, that one of the funniest little things of the last few years was when Tesla gave away the patents to their cars. Because uh, all the world's automotive and business press were just flabbergasted. What, what are they doing? What's the strategy here? What's he, think, you know, what, what's he thinking? And Elon Musk has a blog, and he said what he was thinking. He said, Tesla Motors was created to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport. It is impossible for Tesla to build electric cars fast enough to address the carbon crisis. So you guys go and make all the cars. I'm moving on to other stuff. And people couldn't believe it, really. Particularly the you know, business press thought that has to be spin of some sort. But it is, in fact, the truth. They're a company dedicated to solving the carbon crisis, not making a whole bunch of money off of selling electric cars. Uh, they're not the only ones, by the way. Uh, when you go, again, to some of the jurisdictions that have led the first phase of the transition, you see this uh, uh, sort of next phase coming into, in, in, into um, harder and harder focus. What you're looking at right here is uh, a building called the Crystal uh, in, in London on the banks of the Thames that Siemens built for the 2012 uh, London Olympics as kind of a showcase of its next generation electric uh, tr uh, technology, basically as a showcase of the future electrified city. Uh, it was so successful they decided to just leave it there, so if you're in London and you want to go see what Siemens is up to, uh, it's pretty extraordinary stuff. And if you're not familiar with Siemens, and, and not all of us are in Canada, uh, at a, in a European context, it's, you know, that is a pretty big uh, uh, brand of support for this transition. Siemens is as if General Electric and Bombardier were the same company. That's the, the range of stuff they do and the scale that they work on. And their intention is to build their company not on conventional energy and conventional engineering, but in building this, this uh, uh, building out this energy transition worldwide. So that gives you a, a sense of where the shift is going. Uh, now I want to talk about what it means at the scale of uh, people who are engaged in, in uh, governance and leadership in communities on Vancouver Island uh, and on the coast. And uh, to begin with, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what it looks like uh, at the finish line, in a sense. If the finish line is we need to shrink our carbon footprint by 80% or more by mid-century, what does an urban environment, and by that I mean anything larger than a, than a rural township, uh, what does an urban environment look like at 80% carbon footprint reduction? And it looks something like this, downtown Copenhagen. Uh, the average Copenhagener has an 80% smaller carbon footprint than the average Canadian. And the reason for that is not because of all the wind and all the other sort of energy efficiency stuff they do so much as how they use energy. And your average Dane, and especially your average Copenhagener, uses way less energy to meet their daily needs. And a big part of that is because they are not reliant on internal combustion engines for all of their transport. Uh, this is not something that the Danes came to in some giant bolt of, of enlightenment and, and altruism. It began from the very practical problem of their streets being entirely choked with cars. Uh, instead of making the decision that a lot of North American cities did, which was to build out and more and more roads and the rest of it, Denmark instead went in the other direction, starting in Copenhagen, by beginning to remove cars from the places where the people should be uh, and, and giving over their cities back to... Um, uh, if not entirely, in this, as in this case, at least some of the space on those roads back to things other than cars. Uh, and along the way, they discovered uh, you know, the thing they're best known for, which is that if you put enough space on a road, people will ride a bike on it, especially if you build an actual lane for them and not just some paint on the ground. Um, 
I always point that I know that, that in a lot of your communities it might look far-fetched at this point that people are going to get around by bike, but it's amazing uh, what they'll do if you give them the infrastructure to do it. Uh, one of the things that you always note, you're seeing more of, more of this in North America, but I, that I always note is you'll notice no one arms them, like covers themselves in armor to, to cycle in Copenhagen. They're not riding mountain bikes that are designed to go straight down mountains. They're just people getting around by the easiest means possible. Uh, that may not be bicycles in every community, uh, but it, I think it's, uh, it points to the fact that maybe cars aren't the best solution in every single uh, uh, in every single option. And this is something you see, by the way, in the sort of classic pre-car design of cities at any scale. Uh, these are two more examples, not nearly as deliberate as the, as the Copenhagen example, of a European-scaled city that allows plenty of room in it for walking around, for biking, and, and so forth. These, are, these both happen to be in Spain, and they are cities. Uh, on the left hand, a city of 200,000, and on the right hand, a town of 10,000. And the same principles continue to apply. Uh, now, what good does that do? You know, we're not European. Uh, Canada grew up in a very, very different time. We built our cities around cars because we did a lot of our growing after World War II when cars were everywhere and gas was cheap. Uh, does this stuff work in Canada? We have a very harsh climate here and on and on. Um, so let's examine that just a little bit. Um, here, for example, is an extraordinarily walkable town uh, that I had the good fortune to spend three months in not long ago. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize it, this is Dawson City, Yukon. Uh, I lived in Dawson happily in the dead of winter with no car. Uh, and the reason for that is because Dawson City, unlike a lot of communities in Canada, was built for the Klondike Gold Rush before cars came along and then never changed. Uh, so it's still very easy to get around even when it's, you know, minus 45 and, the, and ice foggy. Uh, you can still easily get around by, by walking everywhere you need to go. And, and oftentimes it's, it's sort of more pleasant because cars don't work very well at minus 45. Um, although Dawsonites are pretty good at solving those problems. Uh, in any case, absolutely well within the realm of possibility. Uh, here is another example that's a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, or less exotic. This is uh, one of the main streets in downtown Banff that was recently retrofitted to give a little bit more space to people and a little bit less space to cars. Uh, I cite it mainly because it was extraordinarily controversial, even for a mountain resort town whose you know, entire reason uh, uh, for being is to make, make things nice for tourists, there was enormous pushback on the idea that people would want to walk around in this lovely mountain town in one of the most beautiful places on earth. Uh, as it turns out, people are totally willing to do that. People don't come to these places to, to, to drive around in, uh, and they won't complain so much if their commute through the town takes a minute longer because you've given them places to sit and, and maybe ride a bike in the summer and that sort of thing. Um, but again, it's, it, it, we are very addicted to the idea that uh, you know, we're not like that. We're not Europeans. This is not a mountain resort town. That We do things differently here. So one more example. Uh, this is High River, Alberta. Uh, for those of you who don't know Alberta, High River is not known as a sort of uh, wellspring of progressive innovation. That's not its reputation. Uh, it is the heart of conservative, you know, right in the heart of sort of conservative southern Alberta. Uh, not the kind of town that you would think would be making radical changes to its streetscape, but High River was badly, badly damaged in the 2013 flood. And when it came time to rebuild its downtown, uh, they had a new mayor, a guy by the name of Craig Snodgrass, and he started asking some questions uh, of, of his counselors. Uh, and they started saying, you know, we could maybe do some of the stuff that's happening in places like Banff. And initially there was enormous pushback, um, but the staff walked him through it, uh, and suddenly he saw the light, and, and he's a great example of, of how much can get done if you can kind of convince one guy with some executive authority uh, to see the light. Uh, great quote uh, when, when there was a, a media story about the transformation of downtown High River into a place you would actually choose to walk around and that sort of thing. Uh, we were told, this is the mayor speaking, we were told you can't do that in High River, you're not Banff. What does Banff have? Well, they've got mountains around. Okay, what does that have to do with having a nice streetscape? Uh, very simple question. Why, is, why would you only do that uh, in the mountains? Uh, the other thing, apparently, the, the pushback that he saw was that, that this is too European. Um, and his response was, what if it works? I don't care where it came from. What if it works? And it turns out, even in conservative High River, uh, you give people a, a nice streetscape, give them some space to walk around in, and they will adapt to it and, and happily uh, uh, begin to move away from uh, using their car for every single task over the or or course of a day, beginning to move toward that smaller carbon footprint that we're all uh, hoping to pursue. 
Um, one last example, because one of the trickiest things with a thing like this, and I probably don't need to tell people in this room because you are people involved in municipal governance, you know how hard it is to convince uh, a, a, a group of people who've never heard of your idea to embrace it, uh, especially when uh, uh, the, you know, they, had, the, they didn't even know it was a thing that they, they had to think about until you mentioned it a moment ago. How do you do that sort of art of persuasion? Uh, to begin with, here's an example uh, of one of my favorite, uh, uh, what's sometimes called tactical urbanist projects uh, of, of persuasion. Uh, what you're looking at is the same streetscape uh, before and after in a suburb of Dallas, Texas called Oak Cliff. And the amazing thing about it is that the, the after photo was a temporary art installation that was part of a street festival. Uh, and the reason for that is the folks who lived in that neighborhood in, in, in Dallas, Texas, knew that if they had gone to City Hall and said, we demand bike lanes on our street, we demand better street trees and nicer lamps, and we want more space for cafes, and we want bicycle parking on our street, the city of Dallas would have said, run along now. But, the, and the, this was basically the merchants and some of the other people on the street. They, what they did instead was they went to the city of Dallas and they got a permit for a street festival. And the permit for the street festival allowed a art installation that they called the Better Block. And so that's what they did for the three days of the street festival. And this served as an enormous catalyst to the community to just demonstrate this is what you could have if we were willing to rethink some of these things. So rather than try to beat them over the head with their carbon footprint, the folks in Dallas realized you could very subtly just show them what a better, what, what a better way to do things might be. And this might begin the conversation and has, in fact, in the case of Dallas, Texas, about changing the way we think about our streets. Uh, it's been so successful that it's been copied across North America, particularly in a lot of US cities that you don't normally associate with radical change, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wichita, Kansas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of them basically doing the same thing from the same toolkit, looking at the resources they have at the street level, looking at what those resources could be, how to make them more walkable and more enticing, and then trying it out for a weekend just to show people uh, the way things could be. What this is, uh, getting away from the specifics of changing the streetscape, is a really, really good example of what is sometimes now called behavioral economics. And if you're not familiar with behavioral economics, it is, to my mind, the single most essential uh, toolkit of anyone involved in governance or talking to people about change. If there's nothing else you remember from my talk this afternoon, remember behavioral economics and, and, and look up the work of Daniel Kahneman, if you haven't already, uh, and all of the people who have interpreted his work. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize as a psychologist in economics. And he won it basically for figuring out how to persuade people to change their behavior. Uh, or, or basically, what does economics look like as a model if you assume people are, are not rational and that changing their behavior will not work simply by appealing to reason? Uh, his work has since been uh, uh, interpreted at a whole bunch of levels, and I'm just going to give you one example so that you get a sense of what this is all about. Uh, one of Kahneman's sort of disciples is a business professor uh, by the name of Robert Cialdini, and Cialdini uh, began as an academic looking at uh, what I think of as the single most ubiquitous and least important sustainability project to date uh, you know, in, in, in Western society, which is the effort to get all of us staying in hotels to reuse our towels and linens. Uh, extraordinary uh, in its success in terms of, of ubiquity. I, I can't remember the last time I checked into a hotel, no matter how big or small, that did not have one of these cards saying, save the planet, save money, have a free breakfast. There's all kinds of different schemes to try and get people to reuse their towels and, uh, and reuse their linens. Um, what what uh, Cialdini did, building on Kahneman's work, was ask, if all we care about is the change in behavior, what message actually works? So they did this test where they tried a whole bunch of different kinds of messages about money saving, about, about being green, about being altruistic. And what they found, by far the most effective technique was, was simply telling people what other people in the hotel were doing. And the more specific you could get, the better. So if you could tell people, you know, uh, most people staying in this hotel are reusing their towels, you get 26% more buy-in. If you could say most people who have stayed in the room you're staying in, uh, were reusing uh, their towels, you got 33% more, more buy-in. And the reason for that is because much as we think we are these incredibly you know, deliberate, rational actors, we're actually pretty simple creatures, and particularly when it comes to hotel towels, we're not trying to make a big statement, we're not trying to assert our individuality, we're wondering what are people like me doing right now? 
Uh, and by the way, you've got an election coming up in British Columbia. That is the exact same wisdom behind lawn signs and why you want lawn signs on private lawns and not just in public space, because that tells people, this is what people like me, this is what the guy up the block with the guy around the corner thinks is a reasonable choice. And that changes the entire impression you have of a political candidate or a decision to reuse your towels or whatever else. Uh, so they built out uh, Cialdini's experiment at the power bill level. How do you change a, a, a power bill? How do you communicate to people uh, who are customers of an energy company to use less power? And this has been a thing we've been trying to do since the OPEC crisis with varying levels of middling success. Uh, Cialdini joined a company called Opower, and they now do very sophisticated uh, um, uh, communication to get people to, to reduce their energy, but again, it began the exact same way. If you, they started in San Diego, California, they went around trying all kinds of different messaging, here's how to save money, here's how to save the planet, buy in this way, buy in that way, but really the thing that was, that was most, most powerful by far was simply to tell people what other people like them were doing. And what they found was specifically, if you could say, if you said, here's what people in the state of California were doing, you got a little bit of interest. Here's what people in the city of San Diego were doing, you got a bit more. Here's what people in your neighborhood are doing, how you're doing compared to them. Then you really saw action. Uh, then people were willing to sort of change the way they did things. Uh, there was one problem with it, though. And I don't know if you can see it, but, but imagine what it is. If you were doing worse than your neighbors, you got better on the next bill and the next bill. But if you got a bill saying you were doing better than your neighbors, you actually got worse at energy efficiency. Because it was like you'd been given a get out of jail free car. I'm, I'm better than everybody else. I'm just gonna you know, leave those lights on or whatever. Uh, and so they had to come up with some way of communicating success that kept people on, t on task. And so this is the revamped version. I don't know if you can see the incredibly sophisticated communication tool they used. I'll make it bigger <laughs> so it's clear. This is exactly how uh, you know, rational and sophisticated we are, particularly in groups when we make decisions. We are looking to see what people like us are doing. We are looking to be rewarded when we do well. We're looking to feel like we're part of something good that, that you know, belongs to our community moving forward. Uh, whatever you do, whether it's you know, in the realm of this, this extraordinary project to reduce our uh, carbon footprint in the next 20, 30 years, or simply you know, changing people's minds about garbage collection and potholes, this is the thing often we think of last, which is how to tell people about it and why it's changing and why it's good, really should be the first thing we do. Uh, why is this happening? Why is it good? How you can be a part of it? Why people like you think it's a good idea? These are actually the essential questions. And so hopefully, uh, if nothing else, you'll, you'll take that away. Remember to include the smiley face in, in, in your projects, in your deliberations. Uh, have a great conference, and, and as you uncover better and better ways uh, uh, to reduce your carbon footprint and everything else, feel free to drop me a line. A lot of what I talk about and uh, write about is, is because at events like this, people come up to me afterward and say, hey, did you know that this thing is happening in my, in my neighborhood? And uh, so I, I'm always happy to hear from people. Uh, I think we've got a little tiny bit of time for questions, so I will... Uh, uh, or do we? Uh, have I blown right through it? <laughs> I don't want to keep people from their coffee. So maybe what I could say then is, if you have a question, I will stick around, come ask me privately, and I will uh, uh, turn over the podium with, with, with my thanks for your attention. <clears throat>